Welcome to the Linux Spotlight. This show is dedicated to showing off the best thing about Linux, our community. This community is made up of developers, distro maintainers, YouTubers, and everyday users. Each one plays a vital role in our community. And the goal is to have a discussion with each individual about their journey into Linux and beyond. So join me now as we turn the spotlight on. Hello, I'm your host Rocco and with me today is my friend, David Muller. Dave, how you doing, brother? I am excellent. How are you doing? Dude, this conversation <laughs> is something I've been looking forward to since we talked about it. So I have my um, Linux Spotlight mug. I have an open mic and open ears, and we're going to talk. How about that? That sounds like an excellent plan. And I'm surprised that you've been anticipating without cringing. <laughs> Come on, dude. <laughs> I've seen you cringe at some of the things I've said on Biddle. Okay, so you might have said some things that I gave a second look about. But, <laughs> well, people know you or will probably know you from seeing you on Biddle. Um, being in the Telegram group and, um, you know, just being an active member in the community. But who would you say David Muller is personally? Honestly, the response I give most often is, I'm not a human, but I play one in time space. <laughs> I, I view myself as a wanderer who has never had more than a passing acquaintance with what most people call reality. Um, I love to learn. I love to communicate. I love language. Um, and I just kind of wander through life and play. Very nice. Well, what do you play as a day job? I drive a semi, uh, American truck simulator in real life, uh, in order to get money to buy computer toys. <laughs> now, are, are you uh, long haul over the road? Are you local, regional, or what? Uh, regional. I generally run Wisconsin to Tennessee or Kentucky, Indiana, up through Minnesota, Michigan, just the, the Midwest region. Right. Well, that's actually, um, that's actually pretty far. I mean, that's not, you know, over the road cross country, but it's definitely longer than I, I used to drive a tractor trailer myself and I was just local, uh, deliveries, uh, basically me in another state around me. So, um, yeah, that's definitely longer than I drove, dude. I see for me, driving is my thinking time. I love to drive. So what you did, P and D, you know, stop and stop and start and stop and start, and it drives me crazy. <laughs> no, nothing annoys me more than somebody who makes me come off of cruise control. Because I set the cruise control, my brain goes into automatic, and I start wandering off and thinking, and and let my subconscious handle the road. Yes, but see, that's the thing. Um, you just hit the nail on the head there with with patience. Um, I drove, but it's got to have been like I don't know, twenty five years ago that I drove. And I don't know how I would have the patience to drive in today's world with today's drivers. I don't know how you do it. Uh, I generally refer to them as speed bumps in training. <laughs> and I just keep remembering Zeb on his live streams, smashing all the caravans and just keep that in mind. And right. it helps me get through. Well, there was some there were some close calls that I had with people then, um, as far as like very angry people, people stopping and like had this guy stop at a toll booth one time. Well, we won't mention that, but uh, what I'm saying is like today's drivers are way angrier, I think, than they were years ago. Um, they were, you know, some of them were angry before, but it's almost like it's so widespread that, like I said, I don't know how you do it. I. I really don't see them as angry as, as much as they, they view themselves as they have to get where they're going and, you know, everybody else needs to conform to their needs. And let's see, the thing is, everybody on the road is doing that. Yeah. So 
you know, and I, I am just as guilty of it, but trying, trying to explain to people that that gap in front of the semi that they leave isn't for your convenience, but for your continued survival, <laughs> just, just doesn't get through to a lot of people. But there's a gap that I can fit into, Dave, you know? Which is I, why I refer to them as speed bumps in training. <laughs> yes, it uh, brings back bad memories, Dave. It brings back bad memories. <laughs> so do you have any hobbies outside of Linux? Uh, I read everything I can get my... Well, not everything. I, I read a lot uh, constantly. Um I write poetry. I enjoy Ren Fairs. Um, nice. I have three adult kids that I enjoy spending time with. Um, and a lovely wife who tolerates me. I have no idea why. Um, but mostly things involved with language and words and talking to people and learning. I love to learn. Right. Well, you mentioned uh, earlier um, when we were talking before the show, you mentioned about the Renaissance Fair and, and the poetry part of it. So, like, give us, the, give us what you do at a Renaissance Fair. Uh, the, the time I was there, I was actually working in a jewelry shop. Um, I knew the owner, and, you know, so I, I worked in the jewelry shop. But those who volunteered and played the court uh, let me come down and play. And I got to know them and I spent time there. And each year I would write a custom sonnet for the queen and go down and present it to her. And, you know, after five, six years of this, you know, I was known for it. And there was a year where they had an actor come in and play Shakespeare. And so, you know, one of the nobles got it in his head that he was going to sponsor me in a contest against Shakespeare. Um, and so they, they put together this thing as, you know, kind of a skit to do one day uh, where I went up against Shakespeare in a contest of poetry for the queen. And it, nice. it was, it was kind of hard for the queen because there's this paid actor playing Shakespeare and me, who's just this schmoo, you know, who comes in and does poetry for them. Um, and the reaction from the crowd was clearly in my favor. And so the queen's like, I really don't know how to react. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, can you give us one of those sonnets? I want one from Shakespeare. Oh, <laughs> great. <laughs> All right. Um, Elizabeth, who sits the throne on her majesty's summer progress. And this was what presented to her in 2015. On progress is a prince above all men, who holds the English world within her love, from chalk white cliffs and highland heathered glen to far flung ways with gulls adrift above. A gift from God reflecting heaven's grace as light to guide our feet to better days, across the peril of life's steeplechase, while England seeks the whole world to upraise. Yet there are rigid men who wish to see the crown worn by a Rome-led Jezebel. Thus I will raise to you this humble plea. Let each man set his soul to thwart their spell. For when God breaks their final heart of stone, it will be Elizabeth who sits the throne. Nice. That's awesome, dude. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, that doesn't happen to be the one that won, did it? Um, No. Actually not. It was the, the topic of the contest was love beyond death. And I actually asked him, you know, are you going to use one actually of Shakespeare? I asked the actor, are you going yep. to use actually one of Shakespeare's or write your own? Um, so I know whether to write it for the Elizabethan ear or for the modern ear. And he said, I'm going to write my own. And I had already written one of each. So I just used the modern one and which is why the, crowd reacted well to it because it was geared towards a modern ear. Right. Right. Awesome. I love it. Well, you were also telling me beforehand that you were a DJ in college, I think. Yes. Uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, WMUH 91.7 FM, Uhlenberg College. Uh, it, it was interesting because 
uh, my best female friend in college who ended up marrying my roommate in college. Uh, she had the 10 to midnight Friday night and I had the midnight to 2 a.m. So we would just go in at 10 o'clock Friday night and party for four straight hours on the radio. Never paid attention, you know, got, got calls from my mom who would call in and her nickname at work was the Iron Maiden. So she would request Iron Maiden for the Iron Maiden. We, we literally just sat and party for four hours and it was, you're listening to WMUH 91.7 FM in Allentown. I'm your host, Scarecrow. Welcome to the Witching Hour. <laughs> Got that radio voice going on. <laughs> it's one of those things you just learn to do. And it's like, yes, you've won a year's supply of rice aroni, the San Francisco treat. <laughs> I love it. Yep. Well, it, the, the voice is an instrument like any other. And, you it know, I, I have been actively practicing with it and working on it for what, almost 40 years now? So I should certainly hope I can get some practical good use out of it. Someday I'm going to learn that. Someday. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always tell people I, I was gifted with a voice for speaking, but they always, for some reason, want me to sing. And I'm like, uh, no, doesn't work <laughs> that way. I, it's, it's good for speaking. I can do lots of things. Storytelling. I can do lots of different voices and, and you know, Make make the story come alive for kids, but but singing right. no doesn't work. Very nice. Well, where did uh, the Dreaming Wolf name come from? Um, one of my times in in college, I did a lot of wandering philosophically and intellectually, which I still do, but I. I Spent two summers at a summer camp out in the Four Corners region and got to know some of the Hopi Indians and the Native American culture. And so the shamanic tradition, you know, blending with that. And they generally uh, referred to their shaman um, with the name Dreaming Something. Mm -hmm. And uh, the wolf is actually, according to when I was born, that is my pri primary totem. Um, secondary is bear, which is very appropriate because in high school, my nickname was Fozzie Bear. Um, <laughs> but so, you know, with the wolf is my primary totem and wanting to emulate the shamanic tradition, um, dreaming wolf. Very nice. So let me ask you, Dave, you work uh, driving a truck, so it's not tech related at all. Um, what is it like when you talk to people, family, friends, coworkers, whatever, about Linux? Like, do they look at you strange or do they understand what you're talking about or what? Uh, I have learned not to. <laughs> I, I am tech support for people and they come to me with questions, but. Um, aside from my mom, who, you know, studied computer programming in college, um, as, as soon as I start explaining what I'm doing, eyes glaze over. They, they just want me to come in, work my magic, and have, it, have their stuff work again. Uh, they, they, we, we don't discuss it. I don't even try anymore. Yeah, I get that same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you mentioned uh, your your mom, and uh, you had said something earlier to me. Uh, you were born basically for computers, right? You were born with them, bred into. Yeah, them. It, it's in my DNA because um, I, I discovered uh, when I was in college, talking to my mom, you know, uh, that she would tell stories about walking down the hallways of the university of Maryland, carrying shoeboxes full of punch carts and God forbid you trip and scatter these thousand punch cards that now you have to pick up and figure out what order they went in, in the box. So you could put them back into the box so that you could feed them as lines of code into the computer one at a time. And so, you know, I, I came out, blessed with a mom who was willing to have it in my DNA, but support me in wanting to explore computers from an early age. Yep. 
that is awesome when that happens. Um, before we go into com the computer part of it, I, I, this is something that I've been talking about lately and, and we've had many conversations about it. But if you could have a tech-related job, computer-related job, would you want that? Um, or would that take away from your fun in playing with Linux when you came home? Um, I am very leery. A lot of people have told me, you know, I, I get the reaction a lot. Why are you driving a truck? You could make so much more money working in computers. And I'm like, but then it would be work. And I, I, there are probably some tech jobs that wouldn't cause that to happen, but I have a great fear that it would. And I don't, this this is my play. This is my mental stimulation that I desperately need. Um, and I'm afraid to risk that just to get a few extra dollars. Right. So I, I, no, I am terrified that it would make me not want to come home and play. And so I avoid it like the plague. I just don't know if that would happen. Like I have that fear that if there was ever a time I had the opportunity to get a job in tech, I just like, I don't even, you know what I mean? It's like, I just don't know if I would take it because this is like me talking to you <laughs> and doing Linux spotlight is fun. I don't want it to be work, you know? Yes. So. All right. So let's start at your beginning dude with computers. Uh, what was the first computer you used? I honestly don't know what model it was. Uh, I was in eighth grade. I was in eighth grade in a prep school in Maryland. And uh, it was the, the schools divided into lower, middle, and upper school. Eighth grade is the top grade in the middle school. A friend of mine who had discovered the computer lab in the upper school dragged me over there one day. And it was dump terminals with a little main computer hub that had the old 11-inch floppies in it. Um, and just dump terminals, the old CRTs that had massive burn-in problems. Um, but I remember learning to play Lunar Lander <laughs> on that. And that, you know, that, that got me right there. That got me hooked on computers and you were able to start writing programs in basic on that system. So I went out and bought the, the, the big book of the time, basic, basic. Um, and I started teaching myself to code and I, you know, all the chances I got, I would be in there playing on a computer, trying out different, um, programs that I had written. Nice. Well, when do you get your first computer at home? Is that a long time after that or? A um, couple years, two, three years after that. Uh, the first computer I ever owned was a Timex Sinclair 1000, a, a little keyboard thingy uh, with a built-in processor, 2K of RAM. Um, had to hook it up to my TV use that as a monitor and anything I wanted to save, uh, went onto a cassette tape recorder, um, with a, you know, type thing. Um, that, that does, that was how you save stuff. And it was, you know, more learning to program basic and see if I can get my own video. So I'm um, not video, but graphic stuff up and displaying on it. Um, and that was the first one I owned. Okay. So you're, ha you're starting to code. Um, when does Linux come into play? A um, couple decades later. Okay. Well, um, that was, you know, the early 80s. Linux right. didn't even exist yet. Mid 80s, I went to college, uh, discovered the computer lab there and started hanging out and they had a mainframe and a bunch of dump terminals. And, um, it was interesting because, you know, 
the each department had set amount of computer time allotted to it. And so each individual account had a subset of that allotted to it. And um, as an English major, I had an account under the English department and I and the department kept running out of time so often that they finally just for the English department and me individually lifted the usage cap. They, they, well, oh, they wow. let me play because they knew that anytime I discovered a professor that had left passwords where it didn't belong, I would go tell them so they could close that security hole. Right. So they, they knew me, you know, the, all the computer staff knew me, you know, by my second year there, I was working as a lab assistant. Um, I helped them make the transition from dumb terminals to PCs that hooked into the mainframe. Um, the, the most fun I had, though, was my junior year. I'd been working as a computer lab assistant for more than a year. I'd been helping, you know, tutor kids and helping professors with research for two years. And I walk in and I take intro to computer science. And I, I'm sitting there in the classroom and the professor's going through the role and he gets to my name. And I've been tutoring this guy's students for two years now. And he gets to my name and he looks up and he goes, what? are you doing here? I said, I've never taken a computer course. I, I, everything I know, I taught myself. And he went, fine. Show up for the midterm, show up for the final, turn in your homework. I don't care if I see you again. And he turned to the rest of the class and said, um, if you have any questions, do not bother me. Go to the computer lab. He will be sitting in there. Go ask him. <laughs> I love it. Well, Okay, so you have this background. You're already into this. You start this, you know, basic computer program. What? Why wouldn't you, or why didn't you take that career path? I have always had a gift for language, for words, for communication, and so I actually started as a German major, switched to an English major, but at the time, computers. I didn't really see the programming part as just another language, even though it was. Um, a lot of it was still building the infrastructure, building the PC infrastructure, building the compilers, um, you know, learning binary and setting all the stuff up that way. And so, you know, even then, it was it was playtime. It it would I, I never really thought of taking it seriously. It was just something I did for fun to relax. Right. I can agree with that. Definitely. And I still, I, it still doesn't get me to Linux because uh, that was the mid 80s. Uh, late 80s. Uh, got out of college. Kind of drifted away from computers a little bit. Um, but mid 90s, um, I went to work for a rent to own company that shall not be named because they are not very nice people. Um, but I started working there and the assistant manager of the store I was at was the computer expert um, of the time. And up until this time, still, I knew nothing but DOS. I had lived in DOS. I loved DOS, you know, program Turbo Pascal, um, basic, you know, everything was command line. It's all I ever knew. It's all I ever saw. Well, he comes in complaining about this problem he's having on a computer, you know, one of their new PCs. And I'm like, well, I know something about computers. Maybe I can help. He went, no, you know, you don't worry about it. You don't. I'm like, no, I've worked on computers for, you know, in college and stuff. Maybe I can help. So he went, fine. And he took me over and he sat me down and I looked at the computer and I went, what's this? And he went, it's Windows. And it was Windows 3.1, I think. And I went, what? He went, Windows. I said, get rid of it. He said, what? I said, get me to a command prompt. Get me to a C prompt. And he looked at me with the strangest expression. But he did something and Windows went away and there was my DOS prompt. And I started typing in commands and his jaw just kind of dropped and his eyes got really big. And, you know, after about four commands, I went, well, there's your problem. And I put a couple more commands. I said, okay, it's fixed. Go back to whatever that other thing was. And, what it, yeah. and I walked away and he came back later and he went, where did you learn that? I'm like, that's all I ever knew. 
that I, I don't know what this other stuff is, this Windows stuff is. So I, that was my introduction to GUI. And it was a year or two later, 98, it had to be because it, Windows 98 had just come out when I got a Packard Bell desktop. And that's when I started looking around beyond Windows and discovered Linux, um, Red Hat, and SUSE. Uh, before Fedora, before OpenSUSE. Right. So uh, do you still have that same effect with Windows? Ah, get this out of here. <laughs> if I actually need to fix something or get something done in Windows, I pop open a PowerShell and do it from the command line. All right. Um, so tell us about that first experience with those early distros. What were the good things? What were the bad things about it? Uh, good. I got to learn. Um, it was, it was an interesting experience because I specifically remember Susi, uh, came on seven CDs and it was a matter just, just like the floppies in one, you know, and you just have to load them one after the other, after the other to get them at, um, I had a lot of fun, the hardware support, trying to figure out what drivers were needed was crazy. Uh, the biggest problem for me was this was in the age of dial-up, very slow dial-up, and there weren't forums. There were bulletin boards uh, that you could go to. Um, so tracking down information that I needed to get stuff working. Um, oh, you couldn't was, just Google it back then? No. <laughs> Google was a card catalog in the library. <laughs> and yes, I'm from the age when they were actually cards in pull little pull drawers. I'm, I'm that old. Um, so for me, finding the information, I, I learn and I've always learned on computers by playing on the computer till I get stuck. And then I hunt down the information I need to get unstuck. And once I'm unstuck, I put books and whatnot back and start playing again. Right. And I've, I've always done it that way. And so the hardest part for me in those early days was not having easy access to the information to get unstuck. Right. So how, where does the progression take you? You get the, the Packard Bell, I, th I believe you said, for the yep. computer at home. Like, where does that progression take you to where you can install Linux at home? Pretty much I got it home. And within a month, kind of like any time I get a new phone, you know, within a day, I've ripped out the software and put in a new operating system. Um, but even back then, you know, with Windows 98, yeah, it was okay, but I wanted to play because I love the little chameleon um, that was Susie. <laughs> and, and Red Hat was, was fun, but it was kind of stuffy. My perception, not anything that was... It, well, Red Hat was the business and Susi wasn't in my mind. Right. Even though they both were, it, it just didn't seem that way. It always had that fun element about it. Yeah. The, the computer behind me, the, the sticker on the door is from then. And it's a little chameleon playing on a desktop computer. So, and, you know, inside is one of the Red Hat stickers and it's a Red Hat. Right. It, that, that was the difference. Um, but then I kind of took a shift because, yeah, I would install Linux, but I actually got more into the hardware side of things for a while. Um, and I started building my own computers. That's where I got started building computers. Um, but I got more into that, um, got into overclocking of computers and got into overclockers forums and um, all that stuff. Uh, and it wasn't, that was actually the first time early two thousands when they were first developing Ubuntu. Um, one of the places they brought it for beta testing was the overclockers forums. And so I remember actually that's one of the things that kind of pulled me back into the software side of things, you know, seeing this new version of Linux and, Oh, I remember that. 
and you know playing with that and so going back to the other forms um and the the two have kind of melded to where at this point you know a, I see so many people in the Biddle community and whatnot, you know, playing games and getting together to play games together. And, you know, I'll, I'll play games for a couple hours, but more fun for me is wiping the discs and installing an operating system and putting it together. Kind of right. like, you know, building the hardware, you know, putting the hardware together to make the system, but then putting the software together to make the system as well. So I actually have more fun installing and setting up operating systems than most people have playing games. That's called uh, distro hepatitis. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> In the extreme. <laughs> so is there a point, a certain time, that you go from running Windows to running Linux full-time? No. I, even to this day... I, I have to keep a uh, Windows, whether it's in a VM or currently, I usually just keep it on a separate disk and pop it in my IC doc. Um, but for my driving, my Rand McNally GPS, mm -hmm. the, the doc software to update it only runs in Windows. It right. won't run under Wine, and it's I, I need specific... Um, virtual machine USB pass through, which I usually don't stay on a distro long enough to get set up properly. It's, it's just easier to throw in another hard drive, fire up windows for a day. Um, it lets me play the few games I have that don't play well on Linux. And then I drop out of it and go back to Linux for all the other stuff I do. Right. So you do run Linux full time. It's just that you keep a windows install around. Yes. Um, ever been into Max? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sh I mean, short answer. I mean, the closest is I have, I, I was given a 2005 MacBook and I put Peppermint Linux on it. <laughs> <laughs> Figures. And, and, and I have an iPad. Um, okay. But other than that, no, I, I stay away from the Apple ecosystem. Honestly, they, they make really good stuff. But I prefer to be able to tinker toy, mm -hmm. you know, be it, you know, Android, I can put in a custom ROM, um, PCs, I can build and put whatever operating system I want on them. You can't do that with Macs, you know, unless you're going to rip it out and put something else like Linux in it. Right. Um, but I can tweak Windows. I can tweak Linux. You really can't tweak Mac you know, the, the OS software, the OS operating system. Yep. So that it, it's nothing against thinking that they have bad stuff. They have really good hardware, really good integration of software and hardware. It's just not for me because I love to play. Right. Well, you know, you, you talk about distro hopping and I know that you distro hop all the time, but what no. about on your main machine, dude? Do you have a main machine where you don't distro hop or is that included in all of your hopping? Um, well, in, in your paper, you, you said, what operating system do you have on your main machine? And my honest answer to that is, well, what day of the week is it? <laughs> um, we, we are on my main machine right now. Um, uh -huh. it's, it's what I do all my work on. Uh, the one that has the Windows disk that I can pop in when I need to. Um, but for a long time, I was on Arch. Um, then, By the way. It, it didn't go away because the computer behind me still has it. That's my wife's computer, so it has Windows, but it dual boots with an Arch install. Um, then Cubicle Nate got me back into OpenSUSE. So I... Um, this machine spent most of 2019 in OpenSUSE. Wow. Um, now it's on Kubuntu. Um, so it, 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 it varies. Um, 
from is there certain um, ones that you stick to on the main machine like uh that will last longer maybe the main reason kubuntu is lasting is the vpn that i use has a deb install file yep um but it doesn't for any other it, it's the only Linux install file that it has. And it, it's not, I haven't taken the time. I was already out of Arch, so I haven't taken the time to go through the AUR to see if it's in there. But it's, it's not one of the big popular main VPNs. So most people don't, haven't taken the time to port it over. Um, so, but I, I prefer rolling releases even on my main production machine, because it's reached the point where Arch is stable, even though it's rolling. Um, OpenSUSE Tumbleweed is stable. Um, Fedora Rawhide is stable. Solus is stable. Well, I mean, I think that um, it, I guess it depends on your version of stable, but, or your definition of stable, but the point to that is you have the technical ability and knowledge to keep that up. So if there was a problem with Arch or Solus or any of the other ones, you would have the technical knowledge to fix that. So it's not, so I wouldn't consider it unstable for somebody like you. Maybe for somebody that doesn't have that technical background that can't just go and fix it, doesn't even know how to fix it, it might not be stable for them. I, I can understand that. Uh, one thing you need to understand about me is I assume everything I can do and everything I know is just common. Everybody can do it. You know, it's and so, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> but it, so you know, when 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 I I look at a system and I have no problem dropping, you know, because the bootloader screen crashed, grub crashed, you know, throwing in a live disk and cheroting into the system on the disk and, and changing what files I need from the command line and editing them on the command line. I assume everybody can do that. That that's why it 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 surprises me and catches me off guard when people, you know, discuss things not being stable and hard to do be because I just I I assume what I can do anyone can do. Well see that's the thing. Like you've installed Arch countless times probably um and yet there are a lot of people that don't even have the desire or maybe even the technical background to install arch itself from scratch arch is actually easy to install from scratch <laughs> well no th this is in relation to back in the day doing a stage one gentoo install Oh, wow. With, with, with the 25 printed out, the 25 page install manual, going through it page by page, setting up all the C flags and, you know, all the other background stuff, um, compiling the kernel and pulling down and compiling all the software. Um, so the, the nightmare memories of doing that, <laughs> even though it wasn't a nightmare at the time, it was, it was just fun. It took me days to do it, but it was fun. Right. Um, but you know, mo modern arch is 15 minute install compared to that. Well, yes, comparatively speaking from what it was or what it could have been, it's easy, but for somebody that's never touched a command line, mm, yes, it's not really easy. But see that, that goes back to, I, I assume everybody has used the command line because it, it's what I grew up with. I, it's just what was right. Well, um, I can say that I have done an Arch install and I actually have done two or three Arch installs, but I can't say that I'm as technical as you are in the, in the command line. I am surely not as proficient in it as you are. So um, everybody has their different levels, dude, of what they can do and what they can't do. So um, you said you run uh, Kubuntu now on OpenSUSE. Did you, what uh, DE did you use? Or maybe the better question is, what is your preferred desktop environment? Generally, KD, uh, Plasma. If I'm using that or a window manager, like awesome. 
Uh, Gnome never really felt comfortable for me. And maybe that was because the first GUIs I got used to were Windows. And Gnome is a radical departure where Plasma isn't. Right. Um, I think that's part of it. Uh, For me, on my main machine, I tend to stick with Plasma as my DE because aside from the tiling window managers of the DEs, it is the only one I've come across that in out-of-the-box settings, I can dictate which monitor and which desktop a program will start on. Right. Um, That doesn't shock me, Dave. I mean, that doesn't shock me that you would run KDE because, I mean, it's a tinkerer's dream to run KDE because of all of the settings. So, yeah, that doesn't shock me, dude. um, On on my laptops, I, I tend to be a little more flexible and willing to try different stuff because it's a single screen. And if I, if everything's going to come up on the single screen anyway, you know, I can start it and then right click on the bar and send it to a different workstation, you know, a right. different workspace. Um, it's just when I have multiple screens that I tend to be pickier about what that's, that's why, um, for the distro challenges on Biddle, I, I don't mind generally I'll use whatever desktop environment they like as a preference uh, because it, it goes on a laptop. It doesn't, those do not go on my main machine or if they do, they're in a virtual machine, which is on a single monitor. Right. Well, you participate in the Biddle challenges all the time. So we've done a ton of different ones lately and I'm sure, I am sure, 100% sure that you do <laughs> other distros as well in between Um, so do you have any, has there been any lately that like has really excited you to, to maybe not be your main distro, but man, that's really cool. I really like what Eric Dubois has done with Arco Linux. Um, that arch branch, um, in addition to the thousands of YouTube videos he puts out explaining everything that might be a problem. Dude, and you're not lying. There are <laughs> there's over a thousand videos yes. in there that he's put out. Um, but Solus, I've enjoyed playing with. It, it's just the package manager being able to put whatever I want on if it's not already packaged for EO package. Um, trying to shoehorn it in. Um, but one that I've been going back to for every once in a while for years, um, now that I've actually got some decent sound equipment, um, Ubuntu Studio. I, I just re... I, I discovered that on an app, Optimus laptop, having the NVIDIA drivers out of the graphics drivers PPA is a good way to make your laptop not be able to boot. So, oh darn, I had to nuke and pave. So I, I, you know, put, it's, it's a gaming laptop. So I put Ubuntu Studio on it. It's got the power to be able to handle all this stuff that's in there. And on my main rig, like I said, I'm running Kubuntu, but I went in and the Ubuntu Studio install program. Right. The offer. Yep. I took that and dumped all of that into my main rig. And the only thing is it doesn't by default switch you over to a low, low latency kernel. <laughs> um, so I had to do that, um, which is what my system is running now. Um, low latency kernels and single click for the win. There but you go. <laughs> just had to get that in. <laughs> Very nice. So, well, I have not tried. I could have, and I should have maybe. Um, but I am really hesitant to try messing around with the main machine. Like I could install that to put everything from Ubuntu Studio on here on Pop! OS, but I am just so leery about doing anything like that because man, when I have an interview set up or when I have a, you know, the live show to do, I can't be messing around with maybe something changed or 
uh, this this thing broke because or or is acting differently because now this is you know introduced to the system and that just scares the that scares me to death. So I'm not gonna do that. If only you had something like an icy dock. Wow! Don't even bring up icy dock, dude. <laughs> Wait, Mark Greaves in the chat yesterday said this. One of his pick, his prediction was that icy dock would release a M.2 dot yep, I, I saw that, and I was I was trying to small little slide in. Um, I honestly that has freed me to do a lot more distro hopping than I used to because, like I said, I don't dual boot my system anymore. I literally just swap disks in my IC doc when I want to put in Windows. Well, dude, you know, like I bust on IC doc all the time, okay? Because the one that I picked, the the particular, I mean, they have a ton of different docs. Right. The one that I picked, um, and it may have been not even that line of dry, uh, docs. It just might have been the specific one I had. It just wouldn't eject the drives. And I had to physically unscrew it and take it apart to it just fell off of the drive itself to get those drives out. Right. But I have single ones that are just take a single uh, spinning hard drive and they work flawlessly. So it's not, I mean, I give Icy Doc a hard time, but it's, <laughs> they're, they're really very nice. So I, and I understand because even in mine, um, I have a spinning rust three and a half inch disc, but it's thicker than the SSDs that I have and the other spinning rust ones I have. And it will stick and I will have to force it out, which is right. why it's sitting in a stack over there and not in use anymore. Well, even if I wanted to, because I had just recently upgraded the test machine to a different one. Uh, but even if I wanted to, I couldn't put those in because it doesn't have a front opening case. Ooh. So there's no there's no DVD drive. There's no drives from the front end. So I can't even use it anymore. Yeah, since I build all the desktops that the house has had since 98, um, I don't have that problem because I get to choose the case. Right. Yep. Yeah. That is a plus. Well, it's a nice case. Both of them are nice cases, just they don't have that option in them. Right. So. Well, Dave, you've been around for a long time. Have you ever been to a Linux conference? I have not. And it wasn't before this year that I ever went to a lug meeting because I didn't know they existed. So you have been to a lug meeting? Yes. Um. What what are your thoughts on them? Are they, I mean, I've actually never been to, and I, and I know that uh, my buddy will yell at me for it, but I've never been to the local lug around me. So what is it like, dude? A lot of it depends on the lug itself um, because Ryan posts a lot of stuff in Telegram about his lug meetings. And they do a ton of stuff that we never do. We generally get together uh, second Saturday of the month and somebody will present something. And if there's nobody presenting anything, we'll just get around and discuss stuff. And it's, it's just get together and chatting for a couple hours. Um, right. Ryan has done, you know, the pull, his lug has pulled in the kids and, brought in Arduinos, I think it was, or Pies, and had the kids do projects with them. Right. Um, so it, it depends on the lug itself. Yeah. Um, it, it's worth checking out. And if you don't like it, fix it. Make it better well, yourself. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, okay. So the main barrier for me with this lug is not the fact that I don't want to be there or not the fact that I wouldn't want to go. It's just that the time that it is, is, you know, I work an unpredictable time job, so I don't know when I'm getting home. There are nights where I don't get home till seven o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. um, and this lug meeting is an hour away, basically, man, maybe 40 minutes uh, from me, and it's at 7 p.m. So it's, it's not like I can, I can't predict when I'm going to be there. So I just haven't timed it right to make it and have enough time to be there. So we'll see. It it wouldn't hurt if you have 
one of those evenings free because most lugs, it, it's not like you're expected to attend. You know, you, you show up when you can. Um, honestly, Biddle is my main lug. Yep. Virtual lug. All right, brother. Are you, are you like this hardcore open source guy? where, you know, everything's got to be open source and nobody can use any, it's all got to be open and free software, or are you like that pragmatic guy who, you know, is okay using proprietary software if that's the best tool for the job? Not because you like it or because you, you know, any other reason, but it, it just happens to be the best tool. I run NVIDIA cards, video cards. So, yeah, no, I don't have a big issue with propriety. Most of my poetry is written in Word. Right. You know, before, you know, Linux office suites got good enough um, to really compete and to transfer stuff over. Yep. Um, now I, I use SoftMaker office, which is pretty much interchangeable. Mm -hmm. the, the one you pay for. But I still... Because my youngest daughter is still in college, I still keep an Office 365 subscription going. So I use whichever is quickest on the machine I'm on. Um, proprietary, I'd like to see more open source stuff. I would honestly prefer that the hardware vendors and their drivers, that would be more of a priority for me getting open source than software programs um that's personal preference but i i am very pragmatic when it comes to me being able to play whatever lets me play how i want to play is just fine with me what do you think do you think uh, nvidia open source their drivers i don't know something that actually occurred to me when we were discussing this last night is I was wondering, because I know that the NVIDIA GPUs are used in a lot of the high-end scientific um, modeling programs, and I was wondering if there was a way that they could open source the hardware drivers for desktop use, but still keep proprietary the stuff for, you know, the high-end computing. Right. I, I don't know how intertwined the two are, um, though they're probably very intertwined considering the high-level computing is what they use for ray tracing. Um, but I think if they want to continue to compete with AMD, who is just getting so outrageously good. Yep. They're going to have to, at some point, at least a major portion of it. Um, if not the software, at least the hardware level drivers, they're right. going to have to open source. Yep, I agree. And I think it's great, the competition that AMD is, is giving, and it's pushing NVIDIA to do things that maybe they wouldn't have done without it. So that is I, good. I remember... Uh, early 2000s when it was nvidia and ati you know the radeon but back then you know radeon was good and they were pushing nvidia and they were pushing each other back and forth you know each was coming out with the next generation and then ati kind of fell away um and nvidia got lazy and rested on its laurels but yeah. now amd is coming back and scaring the snot out of both NVIDIA and Intel. Yep. Well, I never, I had an ATI cards. I never looked at them as good. Uh, the catalyst drivers for me were horrible. Um, but That's why I became an NVIDIA. <laughs> then that's why I switched over to NVIDIA and never looked back. Uh, but yeah. So I'm glad that, I'm glad the competition's there. So, Dave, those reasons that you talked about in the beginning, you'd like to tinker, you like to uh, try new things, you like to learn things. Is that what drives your passion for Linux? Yes. 
I s- still, I mean, finding out new and wonderful ways to break distros <laughs> so that I have an excuse to nuke and pave. I, I am, am forever, you know, digging around and finding new software and trying it out and finding out why it doesn't work and see if I can force it to work and, and then breaking something and seeing if I can fix the breakage and learn how to fix it without reinstalling, even though I love to reinstall. Um, but the, the challenge of breaking a system and then figuring out how to fix it. It, it fascinates me. You lost me there, dude. Um, you said that uh, the challenge is breaking the system, and I don't find that as a challenge. I find that very easy to do. But then you said something about fixing it, and that lost me completely. <laughs> well, it was kind of like um, the NVIDIA drivers, you know, on my laptop for the Optimus. It just kept bringing up the. Um, an error message instead of dropping into grub after I switched over. And what I discovered was that in an Optimus laptop, the initial boot, if you have pure NVIDIA drivers without any reference to Intel, um, the NVIDIA drivers don't have any access to the screen or, you know, to set up the initial. Um, graphics that runs through Intel, then it jumps dumps to uh, Nvidia. So I, I realized that if I wanted to, I could have stuck in a live CD or a live USB, um, booted into a live environment, dropped into a command line, um, cherooted into the disk operating system, and once there, changed the drivers from. The 440 that was in the graphics drivers PPA back to the 435 from the Ubuntu repos. Um, reset everything, you know, make make all the boot programs, um, make init RC um, to reinitialize all the boot files that needed reinitializing. And, you know, I, I could have saved it. But then I'm like, yeah, but that gets me back into Ubuntu. Why not just nuke and pave and put in Ubuntu Studio from scratch? <laughs> so it, it's, I, I did take the time to figure out, I knew what was wrong. I took mm-hmm. the time to figure out why it had screwed up, what it would take to fix it. Realized I could do that, but I was going to end up nuking and paving at some point soon anyway. Might as well just do it now. We have a hotline that can help you, Dave. I know it can. <laughs> well, I don't view it as a problem. <laughs> See, now that is the real problem. When you can't admit you have a problem, that's a real problem, Dave. <laughs> I have a problem. I do not have enough hardware to play as much as I would like to. <laughs> All right, we'll accept it. <laughs> so, what about the community? Dave, you've, the community has not always had a good reputation for being nice to people, and especially, you know, like you had mentioned, you know, about Arch and obviously we've been in an Arch forums. Um, those types of places are not always new user friendly. What has been your experience? Have you seen a lot of that, uh, you know, attitude or has it been a good experience for you? Two different things, because yes, I have I have seen it. Um, when I go hunting for an answer, tracking, following through threads, you know, I, I see people getting roasted a bunch. Um, almost never happened to me, only because when I would go into a forum, not just to read but to actually ask. I would tend to go in and say, look, this is my problem. This is what I've tried. This is where I've looked. Where else can I look to find the information I need? And that almost never got me a negative response. Right. Um, You know, occasionally some high-level snarker 
would go, you know, well, it's obvious, just go here. Um, but for the most part, not saying, how do I fix this? Tell me what to do. But going, where can I find this information has stood me in good stead for not having it aimed at me. And I know that a lot of people, when they go asking for information, are trying to find where the information is. There, there are some that just want to be spoon fed. Right. And I know that a lot of people present honest inquiry trying to find information in such a way that it seems like they're asking to be spoon fed. And so I tend to have an issue when people jump down their throats. Um, and I've from time to time stepped in and tried to either help the person before somebody else could, or try to mitigate the situation when it's already started. Yep. Um, it has gotten a lot better. Uh, there are still some forums that you can go to. Um, I personally never go to Reddit's R Linux thing because of all the horror stories I've heard about it. So I just don't go there. I, I stick with the places that I have found through people like you. Um, and you know, stack exchange and whatnot that, t that tends to be a little more technically oriented. And yeah, you're still going to get people snarked at when they come in who aren't technically oriented into a technical community like stack exchange, you know, and asking generalized questions. Um, but it's gotten a lot better and there are a lot more forums, a lot more communities available now than there used to be. So it is easier for people to find a community that fits with their level of ability. And yep. generally the, the different um, forums have the ones for the more generalized users have the technically adept people, but they know that the forum is more geared towards beginners. So they're a lot more lenient with them and more guiding of them than just beat them over the head with a stick and say, why don't you know this already? Or why don't you go find it yourself? I'm like, you know, the, the overclocker forums, one of the things that was always stressed to us you know, those who had been there a while was that don't just tell them to go find the information, help them explain to them, you know, where maybe not give them the exact page, but explain to them the domain, you know, to go searching for, um, which doesn't always help because, you know, sometimes it would be like, go read the arch wiki. Well, yeah, the information is going to be there. Yep. Tracking down exactly what you need within it. If you're not used to using it, you're not used to using the search function in it can be a royal pain, but the information is there. All of it's there. I, right. I mean, it's a great collective wiki, but I think the biggest problem that I have faced in the past with the arch wiki is that if you follow it step by step from the beginning to end, you'll probably end up at the right place. But it's not always clear where to find the answers when there's an error that doesn't come up in those steps. And that's where uh, the ArchWiki has, has sometimes fallen short for me um, when you put in this input and you get supposed to get this output and, hey, that doesn't happen right <laughs> here for me. So, <laughs> But, yeah, it's getting better, dude. Um, we've come I, a long way. Yep. And you are a big part of why it is. We're At all least, a part of why it is. We, we all are, but you, you do a lot to foster the community. And, and I greatly appreciate that. And that's one of the reasons I look up to you so much is that you, you take the time to build the community and to encourage others to build it beyond just what you have created. 
Yep. I, well, I think that's what we need. Um, if I don't want to build a community that's just for me, I want to build a community that's for everybody, you know? And I think that that's, that is the key ingredient for it to grow. So. All right, dude, you said you, you earlier that you do some coding, scripting, you know some languages. Um, do you have a favorite project that you worked on? Maybe a favorite script that you did? Yes. And I, let's see, I think the last time I used it was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to uh, Destination Linux one time and Dust Geek Ryan uh, mentioned that he had stolen a setup um, hash script mm -hmm. for when he nukes and paves. And I was like, oh, hey. That's a good idea because about the same time, um, it was either DZME or Surge, um, or there was somebody else who Gentoo involved, um, talked about how they kept all their home files on a separate disk and sim linked them in so that they didn't have to reinstall all that stuff every time. They would just sim link it all in and it would all just be there. Right. I was like, oh, hmm. So I started moving all my home files over to separate disks, much less partitions, but disks. And I built a um, bash script. And I have a couple different versions. I have an Ubuntu version, an Arch version. Um, I, I thought about trying to build a cohesive overarching one. Um, now, now, did you steal this bash script like Ryan did, or did you just build it from scratch? I I stole the idea and the basic script from Ryan, actually. But then I went in, and that's when I started, you know, I had to learn how to put up an array, and then for each item in that array, um, check to see if it's in my home folder and on my home disk, and then if it is, wipe it out of the home folder and sim link it in from the disk, um, how to go through and have the script itself go through all the hardware in my system um, because my other disks are labeled as storage and backup. And so from that label, pull out the UUID and the other information and use those settings to update the um, FS table so that, you know, they'll automatically be made. So I, the basic script I stole from him, but almost nothing of that original script is left. Um, it, it's all been tinker toyed and smashed around and um, like adding the SSID um, to use with my GitHub repositories um at the bottom of the script it automatically after it's sim linked in those folders it automatically activates the ssid um for use with github so that i don't have to go through that mess the first time i go to github just as a disclaimer we are kidding about the stealing just in case anybody wanted to know it's free and open software <laughs> Uh, well, to be honest with you, uh, Ryan had, uh, done that script and I like put one or two things into it, uh, and then kind of did the same thing you did and just, uh, morphed it into what I needed it for. And we do the same thing. Basically me and you, uh, have the same mindset as far as backing up. Like uh, all of my stuff is on a different drive and I sim link those folders in, I don't worry about keeping the home folder and then wiping it out and copying it back over and all that stuff. So that, that is a great backup solution. Just saying. I, there are only two machines that I use that I don't do that on. And that's a 2004 HP pavilion laptop and my 2005 MacBook. And the only reason I don't do it on them is because they only have one disc each. Every <laughs> other machine you, I have has can. multiple discs. And 
Well, see, I need to figure out how I can network that. I need to do the script so I can network the drives so that I can use them both on the test machine and on the main machine. If that's even that, possible. Well, no, that wouldn't be hard. The, the one reason I haven't really done that yet and probably won't is because in the initial setup process, as it is, you know, after I install the first boot into the new Linux system, I can automatically access the hard drives that are in the system itself with just point and click. Right. Any, any network drive that I wanted to pull it in from, I would have to set up the networking. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's just, I am lazy by nature. <laughs> I am incredibly lazy. It's like I tell people, I don't work. I sit on my butt and listen to the radio. Why would I want a real job? Um, the, the only time I'm not lazy is if something really catches my interest, like a problem where I just crashed a system. Um, and then I'll sit there and spend the next 12 hours focused totally on what I'm doing and got to get this done. And I really want to do this. And it's, ah, ah. Um, but for the most part, I'm very lazy. And if I can just point and click at this point, yeah, I'm old, lazy. Let me do it. Well, this script that you have, do you also having it? Do you also have it installing software? I have in the past. There, there are sections in there currently commented out, but it does have sections for doing that. Um, the Ubuntu version actually pulls in all the different PPAs that I like to use, and will install them and then go through and install the software I like. Um, and I do the same thing with an Arch install. The individual Arch maintainers that have their own repositories, um, uh, that section goes through and installs all of them, pulls in their um, security keys and installs them, and then goes through and installs all the software. So what software do you choose to uncomment and say, I want, like on a new install, what software do you have to have? Yes. <laughs> Everything. Just the whole AUR. But just download it all. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, it's, I, I tend to overkill in that so that should I ever want to do something. I mean, I, I honestly think in the last five years, I have used hex chat once four and a half years ago, but it's still installed. Every time I put in a new distro hex chat gets installed just in case, just in case I like it. <laughs> so I, you know, the, the stuff I use all the time, um, terminology for my terminal emulator, um, Firefox, Thunderbird. Um, I always do steam Lutris OBS, simple screen recorder. Um, for torrents, I use Tixati, uh, Sublime Text, and Sublime Merge uh, for my coding and GitHub uh, integration. Uh, VLC, and usually one other video player. Um, Audacity, um, Caden Live, you know, all, all, the, all the stuff that I almost never use, but just I automatically put in because I've heard good things about it from people on destination Linux and Biddle. And, you know, I, I just have this huge long list of dark table and yep. <laughs> and that's why when I put in, you know, Ubuntu studio, it's like, uh, uncheck the stuff you don't want installed. I'm like, well, why would I uncheck anything? Just give it to me all. I have GIMP on that list of installed programs. I, I mean, I think I may use GIMP once, uh, once every six months, once a year, maybe. And it still gets installed. I don't know why. GIMP, uh, Zoom, uh, Telegram Desktop, Discord, um, 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 Overgrieve is actually the program that I use to sync my local Google Drive folder with my Google Drive. Um, my VPN software, when I actually can install it, which is why I'm still on Ubuntu. Um, so you have a whole list, dude. 
Yeah. Like I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just install ma mass dump install. Well, you mentioned word earlier. Um, is that the, on the top of your list for software to come to Linux? Or is there something else that might top that list for something that you would wish that would come to Linux? My Rand McNally GPS update software. Personally, um, I don't really need Word to come to Linux because the professional version of SoftMaker Office um, does everything I need to do that I would do in the Office Suite. I 90% keep the subscription to Office for my daughter in college because that's what she's used to. Um, I, I don't need it anymore. The SoftMaker pulls in and can save to Doc and DocX. And so right. um, I can switch back and forth and send stuff I make to people with Word and they can open it just fine. Um, so little, little things like, well, Windows has a Netflix app a separate app for Netflix where you don't have to open a browser to get Netflix, something like that. You know, as, as cubicle Nate would say, little, little niggles I have that I would like to come over. But for the most part, everything I need or want, I can already do. I understand that people who do high level video editing, high level audio editing, you know, high level graphics presentation with Adobe, um, that stuff would be very good for them if it came over, but I don't need it. So hey man. For, for me, Linux has what I need. There, there are some games that will play on Linux, but there, there's one game in particular that I can play it on Linux, but some of the video cuts don't play. They'll play in Windows, but not in Linux. Right. So little nickels like that, but nothing major. That's a good place to be, though, man, where you don't need anything to come to Linux, where, it's, where you have what you need. That's a good place to be. Yes. So um, have you ever walked into Best Buy, Dave, and installed Linux on it? Computer there? <laughs> um, not Best Buy. Oh, here we go. Um, my employer one time. Really? I set up a dual boot. And it was not discovered for almost a year. You are kidding. I, I was working in a mechanic shop. And third shift. And I was working in the office. And one of the spare computers that wasn't used at night, I set up a dual boot. And in the Linux, what I actually had it set up and doing was the um, folding proteins to help with um, research. Like SETI does their signal um, distribution, distributed programming. Um, there's also folding, which you pull down information about proteins. Um, they do variations on the folding of the proteins to help with medical research and right. send it back. And so, you know, I'd come in at night and um, switch it over to Linux and start running that. Nice. And I, I made the mistake after almost a year of forgetting to boot back into Windows. Ooh. Were they mad? Um, I never admitted that it was me. <laughs> Okay. Well, that didn't answer my question. Were they mad? <laughs> the bosses themselves, no, because it really hadn't impacted the company at all. It, it, right. was, it was discovered actually by a new supervisor that had come in that was very full of himself. And when, when I left the company a couple years later, um, about six months after I had left, somebody hacked into their server. And the supervisor was like, I bet it was Dave. And the ladies who I worked with in the office 
turned and looked at him and said, um, no, if it had been Dave, you never would have known it happened. I was like, <laughs> yes. Nice. Very nice. All right, Dave, let's get, let's get serious here, dude. This is serious business here. We're talking about, um, and where are you talking to me? <laughs> so there's a lot of people that are coming to Linux. A lot of people that have been in Linux that don't feel that they can contribute to Linux in some way. Um, what would you say to somebody coming new into Linux that if they wanted to contribute, what would you say to them or where would you direct them to? Um, groups like Biddle, even if it's only in the YouTube chat, um, Telegram groups, forums online, asking questions is contributing because I guarantee you, you know, that new person for every question they have that they're willing to go on that forum and ask for clarification of or how to fix something, there are a dozen to 50 other people with the exact same problem who are too afraid to go on and ask, but will sit there and look and see the answer given to you and be able to fix their own. Yep. Even if you don't have technical information to share, to share in community, because I'm sorry, of all of the Telegram groups I belong to, there is not a single one that is Linux-based that has not, from time to time, wandered off into non-Linux discussions. Every single one does. Every forum on the internet does. And if you're there participating, ask questions, even if you don't have the technical knowledge, you can, when the things wander off into non-technical issues, participate. Just, just yep. be there and be part of the discussion. You will reach the point where you have information more than you had when you got there. And by the time you have that, there will be people coming in behind you asking the same questions you asked. And this is part of the reason that, you know, we discussed earlier about the bad reputation that Linux forums have. The people who have answered the question 30 times are like, rah, 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 I don't want to go find the information. You've been there six months. You, you just went through that. You understand what they're going through. So pass on, even if you've only learned one technical thing, that is one thing you can pass on to somebody who's coming after you that they will be very grateful for and will help get them more firmly addicted to this wonderful drug we call Linux. <laughs> See, Dave, this is the exact reason why you need to start a YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> as long as I can hide it so nobody would find it. <laughs> All right, man. Do you believe um do you believe Linux is bad at marketing? You can't be bad at something you don't do. Hmm. This is true. Um so you so you would agree that we don't market Linux enough or the way that we should, maybe. Desktop Linux doesn't get marketed. The marketing you see for Linux, be it Canonical, be it Red Hat, be it SUSE, is all aimed at businesses because that's where the money is. So that's where they're going to spend their advertising dollars to try and get return on investment. Um, desktop Linux, it's, it's all word of mouth and splash over from the corporate stuff. Um, it, it's not that we do it badly. It's that it's, it's just not done. And I don't know that we would ever be able at this point to really make a difference, even if we did, because, you know, 
one of the things you mentioned was, you know, the year of the Linux desktop. Desktops in general, you know, unless you're a gamer or somebody who's getting into computer software and technical stuff, the, the little, you know, operating systems we carry in our pockets now, that thing is, that thing is 12 gigs of RAM. Yep. I think my Packard Bell had 500K, maybe a gig of RAM. I mean, I, I know that, you know, a, 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 what was it? A terabyte hard drive when they first came out, people were like, you'll never, ever be able to fill up a, ter- a terabyte hard drive. You know, it, so the 90% of what people are doing nowadays, they can do on their phone. Yeah. Unless you're into gaming or computer science, desktops really aren't necessary like they used to be. They, they weren't, they are no longer the access to the internet that they used to be. So we, we Linux kind of missed the curve getting into the desktop market and that's not a bad thing but i i don't know that it'll ever be able to catch up well a perfect example of what you just were talking about was um it's really just okay so my dad can put his whole backup of his desktop computer he can fit that probably in I think 20 gigabytes, something like that. That is smaller than the file size for this video that we're recording right now. (laughs) So it depends on who you are and what you're doing uh, as far as what you would need. And um, yeah, that's. And the thing is, 90% of the computer users out there are like your dad. They, They don't need a desktop. Um. But it, it used to be that a desktop, you know, if you wanted to do word processing, if you wanted to do any kind of gaming, if you wanted to get to the internet, you needed that computer, you needed that desktop, at the very least a laptop. Now, you know, between iPads and, you know, my Galaxy Note 10, you know, between tablets and phones that are out nowadays, you can word process, you can game, you can surf the internet, you can do video conferencing on a phone. So, you know, why do you need a big bulky desktop anymore? Yep. Unless you, you know, are a geek like me who has to overdo everything and just has way more than I could possibly need or use. And I'm going to have it anyway, because it's fun. <laughs> Yes, uh, agreed. Um, now there are certain use cases for people, uh, for like for my dad, he would prefer a desktop, but he goes with the small form factor now. You know, he's not got this big, huge tower. He goes with the small form factor, uh, but he m- would much rather have a desktop just because of the screen size, and you know, mm-hmm. he's able to have a big screen to it. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, most people in regular computing nowadays don't need a desktop, and. Honestly, you can put a big screen attached to a phone. Look at Samsung DeX. Yep. You can actually attach a you know, 30-inch screen and a keyboard to a cell phone and use it like a computer. If only it would have taken off. <laughs> Still available. All right. Um, this is like a deep question, Dave. If you could change one thing about Linux, what would it be? Honestly, Linux itself, I would not change. I consider Linux itself to be pretty much limitless in what it can do. The the things I would change in relation to Linux would be the hardware and the limitations imposed by the hardware manufacturers and proprietary firmware, proprietary drivers, because 
that is the only thing, honestly, that I really see holding Linux back in any way. If, if Linux had access to the APIs and the firmware and stuff like Mac and like Windows do and could access all the little bits and pieces of the hardware, there would be no stopping it. it. There would be no limits to it. So Linux itself, I don't think needs to change. It's just shackled by other considerations. Right. Well, um, you talk about shackled. and <laughs> So, you know, I always ask people, you know, the reasons that you chose to run Linux years ago, are they the same and do they still apply today? But there was a saying that you used to say, Dave, when you first got <laughs> to the community. But uh, it's supposed to hurt. <laughs> Linux is supposed to be painful. <laughs> so, and I noticed that you don't say that often anymore. You only say it as a joke. Has Linux come to the point where it's not painful anymore? It has come to the point where it's only painful by choice. It, it doesn't need to be. You can put in Mint. You can put in Solus. You can put in Elementary. And they will just work. Um, Linux is supposed to hurt refers to the tinkerers like me those who poke and prod and try to ram stuff into an operating system that really just does not belong there. But darn it, I'm going to see if I can make it work anyway. Um, for people like me, Linux is supposed to hurt, but it has reached a point where there, and it's not just a single distribution anymore. There are a wide variety of distributions now that you can give to people and they will install and just work and until yeah. you get to the bleeding edge hardware or bleeding edge software which 99 and 44 100 percent of the users aren't going to need there's no reason for it to hurt anymore unless you're me right um so you mentioned uh earlier about gen 2 and um, I know that Gen 2 used to be a pain to install, still is. Um, not really. In your okay, so it's easy for you. Of course, it is. It's not easy. Well, for no, me. It, <laughs> I. It would still be a pain if I actually went back and got a stage one image and started from scratch. But even the Gen 2 website, you you have to go digging to find the stage one. Right. Um, images anymore. The, the, the closest, you know, the only people that really do that anymore are Linux from scratch. Well, Gen 2 used to offer you, and still does, I guess, but the idea of Gen 2 was that you could customize every little tweak for your specific hardware. Yep. So my question to you is, is that even relevant anymore today with uh, as fast as computers have become? Uh, the amount of RAM that we have, the the speed of the CPUs, um, the speed of the hard drives. Does installing Gen 2 right now in today's world offer a significant benefit? It used to, but does it still offer that benefit? For the general user, no. For the audiophile who needs that exacting timing, um, for their audio editing, for the people who do video editing and have to render mega gigabyte files, you know, that extra little bit of speed from the tweaking is, can mean the difference of 15 minutes to an hour saved. Um, people who do scientific calculations who need to crunch massive amounts of numbers on an ongoing basis, um, it will still have an effect on. But for the general everyday user, 
the the systems it will still make a difference but they are going to be so minute that our human perceptions haven't reached the point where we can track those differences yet it it may we may evolve in the future where we can again see the differences because we'll just our brains will reach the point where they can process fast enough and understand. But at this point, our human perceptions, it, it doesn't really make a difference. You're not going to notice a difference. All right. Coming from the horse's mouth. <laughs> somebody, <laughs> somebody who has uh, installed Gen 2, which I have never done. The, the two biggest points for me were figuring out the compile flags and the use flags and the compiling of the kernel going through and actually seeing all of the options that are available. And this was 15 years ago, back then all of the options that were available in the Linux kernel. I, I honestly think it would take me longer nowadays just to go through the kernel make process than the entire install did back then. Linux is supposed to be painful, Dave. <laughs> yes. We're, gonna, we're putting that to rest. And I, I am a anymore. masochist. I enjoy that pain. <laughs> I seek it. Yeah. All right, brother. Is there anything else you want to share with people? Um, Enjoy. I, I, whenever I'm talking to people about computers and I've been asked from time to time, where did you learn all this stuff? I said, honestly, the best way to learn, if there's something on computers you want to learn, or you just want to learn computers in general, the best way to learn that I've ever found is sit and start playing. Just play on the computer, do what you want to do. Eventually, you're going to find some place where you get stuck. That's when you pull out the book or you go online, you find, and you go digging and find the answer. And you'll understand why the oops happened and how to fix it. And once you have it fixed, put the reference materials away. Don't sit there and keep reading them and trying to learn more. Go back to playing. You learn by doing, you learn by playing, you learn by having fun. So just keep, keep that in mind and keep, you know, hanging out and participating in the communities. And you'll learn by osmosis, you'll grow by osmosis, and you will contribute a lot more than you could ever imagine to those around you in the community as a whole. Well said. Very well said. I don't know if you just politely told me to RTFM or, <laughs> but it was well said. <laughs> when you're stuck, RTFM. Otherwise, <laughs> ignore the freaking manual. <laughs> ITFM. I love it. Um, how can people get in touch with you, Dave? Ah. Uh, um, Biddle on Saturday nights. Um, I'm in a bunch of different Telegram groups. Um, a direct message on Telegram. Uh, I have a Discord channel. I don't think I've been there in a year. Um, but if Discord can use messages, I wander into there from time to time. Um, I have a Facebook profile. I go on Facebook maybe once a year. Um, so the so, best place to get a hold of you would be probably Telegram. Yeah. Or if you happen to see me pop into a YouTube chat during a live thing, because I'm usually the one that pops in, the first thing I say is, don't forget to like that smash button, folks. <laughs> So even if I only have like 20 seconds to be able to be in there, that's, that's what I try and do because that is what I contribute. I try and up the like count on the, the live streams of the community members. Awesome. I love it. There's a good way to contribute, dude. 
Dave, I know that you don't always think, uh, well, you have said to me in the past that you don't think you uh, contribute to the community or should be considered in that way, but thank you so much for everything you do. Um, you have supported the channel uh, since the beginning. Um, you have helped people out in Telegram. You are on Biddle giving people your knowledge. And even if it's, and, and I'll quote your words or basically semi quote your words by saying, even if it's one thing that you can give to people, there are people looking for that. So thank you so much for what you do. Thank you for creating the space where that's possible. And it's a community thing and we all get along. <laughs> wow. Okay. We, we all show up together. Right. Exactly. All right, Dave, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for asking me. All right. That's going to wrap it up. Thank you all for joining us this week as we spotlight the best thing about Linux, our community. Until next time, long live Linux. I love a slow internet connection. <laughs> well, this script that you have, do you also having it? Do you also have it installing software? As well as li uh, sim, uh, li <laughs> sim linking. <laughs> I have to reread in my mind the intro because I usually mess it up somehow. You want me to read it? Do you want to read it? <laughs> I can do that. Uh, that would be a change. <laughs> okay. So go ahead. Hello and welcome to the Linux Spotlight. This show is dedicated to showing off the best thing about Linux, the community, which is made up of developers, distro maintainers, YouTubers, and everyday users. Each one plays a vital role in our community, and the goal is to have a discussion with each individual about their journey into Linux and beyond. Join me now as we turn the spotlight on. Perfect. I love it.